close to 20 years, families have been changing their futures through Financial Peace University. I started it with a bad suit and overhead projector. I set the room for 135 people, four people came. And now today we've had over one and a half million families go through this course. That's over two million people across this nation. You may be wondering, what is it? What Financial Peace University is about is a return to God's ways of handling money, but in a very practical, step-by-step -step game plan showing you exactly how to do it. FPU is about learning how to control your money. When you make these dollars behave, you're going to get this sense of power over your money that you've never, ever had. Don't move into a home with 62 debts or six debts or, or two debts and no money. You move into a home broke with a bunch of debt around your neck, Murphy will move in your spare bedroom, bring his three cousins broke, desperate, and stupid. Marriages are being made stronger. Couples are learning how to talk to each other about money and getting on the same page. The closest statistical correlation to success going through this program are those that actively engage in this budgeting process. And for those that are married, they're doing it together. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. When you get disgusted and you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I am not going to live like this anymore. We're done. We're changing this thing. Talk about the why. Talk about your dreams. Ask your spouse. What would we do? Where would we travel to? What would we buy? What would be changed if we became something as a couple where we were working together on that? Now, man, I'm sure you know this, and we've been talking about it for the last few minutes, but it's very true. Women are different, aren't they? Say yes. yes. One of the things you may or may not know is they have a gland right in here that you don't have. It's called the security gland. And when she is feeling insecure due to money issues, that gland spasms, and it is attached to her face. This nine lesson, 90 minute class will challenge you. Now this is a boot camp, I'm your coach. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable sometimes. You're gonna go home and go, I don't really like him tonight. Now if I agree with that, which would make you wrong. <laughs> That's what happens when the coach coaches you, doesn't it? He kind of rubs you the wrong way. There's a little friction on there, right? I've had some good coaches and they lit me up a time or two, but it caused me to go places I couldn't go otherwise. Life change is never easy, but you won't be alone. You'll watch a DVD each week and discuss it with your small group. Your classmates will encourage you and help you take those first steps. You'll walk away from FPU knowing how to relate with money. You'll learn how to pay off debt and save for the future. And you'll learn how to protect your plan. We aren't born knowing everything we need to about money. We learn, and there's no better place to learn than the Word. The Bible offers more than 800 scriptures on money, and Financial Peace University is based on that solid foundation. You are literally going to be doing things every week differently than you ever have based on biblical principles. Uh, things like doing a budget, things like working with your spouse, things like singles having an accountability partner, things like teaching your kids so that a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. It's not theory. This is actual application on everything. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? What would happen? If the, what would happen to the kingdom of God if the people of God were out of debt? All you need is a plan. Financial Peace University is that plan. Amen. Will you stand and join us as we begin our time of worship this morning? Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. with yonder 
morning we started off with uh, with a video for our upcoming Financial Peace University. So if you open up in your bulletins to the announcements page, uh, you'll see that we have uh, we have loosely set that date, right, Rain? <laughs> kind of, we've set it in stone, but then it's also adjustable on what we need to do. Um, but Monday, June 8th, uh, you be in prayer. Um, you know, I think that as we have as we have gone through uh, the last few months in this challenging time, um, the the words of Dave Ramsey and uh, and the 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 promises that God gives us uh, in His Word about money uh, is what Dave teaches. And when it comes to the emergency fund and all those things, uh, now more than ever, uh, people are seeing people are seeing what the the truth of what he teaches um, come to fruition when it comes to uh, many, many, many of us um, going through some financial struggles. And so um, it is very encouraging um, to know the things that we have set in place here as a church body uh, have taken care of us through this challenging time. Um, But more of all, uh, many of the the families that I've had the chance to talk to, um, they, they look back at the things that they have set in place, their emergency fund, and all of the things like that, and, and that is what is sustaining them through this difficult time. And so, um, so if that is something that you uh, would like to participate in, whether you've done it before or you haven't, um, please go on there and get signed up. Um, if you go um, ask Reen here in the here in the bulletins. Uh, Central has its own little, uh, little code to put in when you go online to sign up for it, and so that will, uh, that will get us all taken care of. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, that we as Central have done, we have partnered up with a ministry called Communio, and what Communio does is, uh, is really assisting uh, churches and ministries with their online um, really help Uh, in this time of need and so we have partnered with them and they are offering uh, a a free date night uh, for our for our families and our couples and so uh, we would encourage you guys uh, through this time that that things are still uh, still kind of shut down and so date nights are important right in the health in the in, in of a marriage and so when it comes to uh, when it comes to the health of our families, uh, that is one of our top priorities here at Central. And so, and so if you have any questions about that, uh, you can ask me. Uh, you can go on to our, uh, our Facebook page and, and go on the link there. We're running an ad right now in the community. And so this is something that is not just for our church family. That is something for our community that we are doing uh, for everybody. And so uh, that, is a, a, that is a free uh, tool that we've got for you guys to use uh, as, we, as we strive to grow and uh, keep our marriages healthy. And so the last thing I want to talk about is, is uh, May 17th is a business meeting. It is an important business meeting. And so I encourage you guys to put that uh, onto your calendars so that you can join us then. So let us pray, and then we're going to continue praising our Lord this morning. Will you pray with me? Lord Father, it is good. It is good to be in your house. It is good to see, uh, Lord, brothers and sisters, Lord, worshiping, Lord, praising your name. Uh, Lord, it is so encouraging, uh, Lord, to be able to look across the auditorium, Lord, and see the smiling faces, uh, Lord, of my loved ones. And so as we come... Lord, together, Lord, to praise your name, Lord, to open your word and teach it, Lord, that you will bless, uh, Lord, our, our endeavors, Lord, that you will bless, Lord, what we're trying to do, Lord, and to grow your kingdom, 
So, Lord, be with us this day, Lord, as we hear your word taught. Lord, that we will open our minds and our hearts. Lord, that we won't just simply hear your word, Lord, for a knowledge for us, but, Lord, we'll hear it, Lord, and then we'll apply it. And, Lord, live it out. Lord, we love you. Lord, that is our desire, is to live out your word this morning. Lord, give us this day. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We stand as we continue our time this morning. And then 
there will be an end to these struggles, but until that day comes, we'll live to know you're here on the earth, and I will fear no storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go oh lord you never let go of me and i can see a light that is coming but a heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes, still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. As I can see the light that is coming for a heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes. storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me First Peter 2 9 reads, But you are a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child. He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free. Forsaken, I am who you 
seated. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here. I know you had to get here early to get these seats because we're full, as I can see. But you're, you're scattered out pretty good. Families are mostly together. Some of you uh, are as close as family, so I assume you're okay. I asked Grandma if she could stay with the grandchildren today. No problem. We have quite a few this week over next door, a little big, bigger group this week. But how many of you are over 65? Look around. <laughs> this crowd should be at home. <laughs> My wife, too. According to the letter of the law, but you're here and we're doing our best to be good stewards of the health that we have. But uh, we've got to start somewhere. We're not going to wait till there's a vaccine to have church. So we're glad you're here. Uh, be careful. There's lots of hand sanitizer. Follow the rules as much as possible. We'll have the doors open, so in theory, you can go out without touching anything. But uh, um, be careful, because there are those, even in our church family, who are immune compromised, and there are uh, issues like that that, that we need to be, um, be cognizant of. So welcome to our group over next door. We're glad uh, they're here. I do not know how long phase one is going to last. I did a little reading this week. Phase two means we can have 50 people in a group that can sit a little closer than six feet, but, but if there's more than 50, we've got this six-foot rule maybe for the rest of summer. Um, last week, I got a little bit anxious and decided, oh, let's have Sunday school and just start this thing back up. Um, I'm so thankful that Terry was willing to come. She has a daughter who's very immune compromised. She's got, she and Ted and, and the Allisons, her parents have to be very careful uh, to try not to take that home to their daughter because it, be, it would be difficult. But she came in and she uh, led us in music today. How many of you enjoyed having live worship, huh? Yeah. It was, uh, it's just not the same when the videos come on, and especially since we don't know what videos YouTube's going to kick us off of. And so if you were at home last week and we got kicked off, now you know why. Uh, it's just hard for us to know. 
we should actually, uh, you can't shake his hand and thank him, but you can tell him thanks. Uh, Ryan Dick is, if we didn't have his technology capabilities, uh, we'd really be in trouble during this time. And so uh, uh, he kind of makes things run. He's over next door kind of running things from his little iPad right now, trying to make sure everything's online. And so uh, I really appreciate him being willing to do that. And... Uh, you might want to try some Sunday going over next door if you're one of those that's coming in every week because it might give them someone else a chance to come in and uh, be in, in here. We'll have Mother's Day next week, but we won't be having uh, a Mother's Day like we would normally do uh, sharing. But I would encourage you to call your mother uh, maybe this week early, maybe even set up a Zoom meeting with her. And I'm going to try that with my mom and see. Uh, I kind of miss her more these days for some reason. I'm not sure why, but... Uh, they are definitely hunkered down in Colorado, and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure when they'll lift the 14-day quarantine for out of state, but that's going to be a real challenge this summer in a, in a state like ours. So it's all in God's hands. We're just trusting Him. Uh, I get frustrated some days, and then other days I think, well, Lord, you're, you're teaching us something through all this. So uh, this has been especially hard on me because I've been waiting uh, probably almost six weeks to share this special message today. And so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Seems like we have all kinds of time. Uh, I'm probably not going to need it all. I hope not. But uh, uh, we're not doing the offering. And you know why. Because when you pass the plate, you can pass the virus right down the, the aisle to your neighbor. So there's a, a virus-free box out there on the guest services. And if you're careful, you can drop it in there. Uh, that's another thing I, I, I just uh, am so thankful for. Um, our, our offering last month was extra good. I don't know if somebody had a big amount of money they wanted to donate or what, but uh, we had an excellent month. And uh, so uh, it tells me that you're faithful to the Lord even when you're not able to meet together and come to church and put your offering in the, in the plate like normal. So uh, um, I put my, my tithe check in there this morning and it's kind of nice, but I kind of miss having the, the opportunity to share the offering together. It's an act of worship, is it not? Um, it's a selfless act of giving up uh, something to the Lord. So, But let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Father God, I praise you and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for uh, at least the restrictions have been lifted a little bit so that we can uh, kind of physically distance ourselves. Some are still at home and rightfully so, uh, protecting their, their families and, and themselves. Uh, some are next door, uh, and uh, it's maybe not the best, but it's, it's not bad. And so I, ho I hope that they'll have a time over there to fellowship, and that as we uh, gather here today, you would be honored and glorified in all that we say and do and think, and we trust you for everything. And we give you the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So how many of you ever thought we would go five straight weeks without meeting in this church building? I tell you, it was eerie to be in here during that time. We, we did get some good work done, but, uh, you know, the thoughts, I, I, I started thinking about all that went into to building this building and buying this property and adding that expansion on there and to see it sit empty, it was just breaking my heart. To not have those Awana kids here on Wednesday night, um, you know, and the youth group and, and all these things is just, Lord. But you know, there's a lot of churches sitting empty in Europe and other places that used to be full. And so we are certainly in difficult times. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't pretend to know all of the Lord's uh, thoughts on, on when he's coming back. And I think he intended it to be that way. Uh, yeah, I think he intended it for us to live every day as if today were our last day. And I think that's a, there's some wisdom in that. And, and we'll see that from our passage today. But one thing is for sure. Almost nothing is for sure. But I, I did put almost nothing is for sure. Life can and will change, sometimes slowly, sometimes very quickly, like in the, in the event of a worldwide uh, pandemic. I used to keep a timeline of my life by vehicles I owned. Now, that's a man thing, I don't know. Um, some of you probably own so many. But for me, I can almost think of everything that's happened in my life by the vehicle I owned at the time I owned it. And so as this, uh, this uh, week came along and I was uh, thinking about 
how to share some things. I spent some time reflecting on major transitions in my, in my life. And uh, I went from living with my mom and dad, my biological parents, to living with my grandparents. And the first vehicle I ever dro drove was a, was a Buick station wagon. My grandfather wouldn't own anything but a Buick. And one day, uh, when he was at the Outboard Motor Club, the Buick was parked in the parking lot. And some of my friends and I decided we were going to take a little joy ride. I, I, I was maybe 10 or 12 years old. Only problem is I had never really driven that much before. I could barely really see what was going on, but I watched my grandpa drive, so I figured I knew how to do it. And when I backed out between two cars, I just started turning. That front left bumper scraping on that car next to me was not a good plan. But I, uh, I loved my grandparents uh, very much. They raised me, and uh, I remember my first, my first fender bender, and it was the first time I drove. Uh, I tried it again later, and I had some kids in the back, and we were spinning donies out in the field, and I was, a, I was kind of a little renegade, I guess. But uh, from living in Florida with my grandparents, I moved to Colorado and was reunited with my mom and my stepfather. And my mom had an international scout. I wish we still had that thing. That thing could climb a tree. It could go anywhere. And we used to go everywhere with it in Colorado, all the way to the top of 14-foot peaks. And, and uh, that was a great, great car as a kid to, to just, just run around in. So from there, I went from being lost to being saved in high school. And the first car that I had during that time, I remember, was a 69 Volkswagen Beetle Super Beetle. All right? And uh, Mick can tell you some stories about Volkswagens. He's got a few. But I just loved that car. I still remember I went, uh, the first girlfriend I ever really had, serious girlfriend I ever had, went on a date. And those Volkswagens, they didn't use any gas. And I ran out of gas taking her home after the movies. Not, not a good thing. And so we lived in a rural community. A lot of uh, um, uh, Hispanic uh, Americans lived there and, and illegals, if you want. And I was driving, and I broke down right in front of this house, and there was a whole bunch of these Hispanic guys out there, and they were, they were drinking a little bit. Well, actually, they were drinking quite a bit. And I told them I broke down, and I, uh, not broke down, I ran out of gas. They have asked me if they had any gas. And uh, they just thought that was the greatest thing. So uh, they gave me a hose and let me uh, siphon some gas out of one of their vehicles. <laughs> Have you ever tried to siphon gas out? It's not as easy as it looks. And I didn't, uh, that gasoline on breath wasn't very good when I dropped her off. But uh, Volkswagen Beetle. But those were some good years in Colorado. And um, I thought I might marry that girl, but I... Uh, I don't know if it was the car. I tra uptraded that car from a 69 Chevy Volt, uh, a B, uh, 69 Volkswagen Beetle to a 70 Chevelle Supersport. And I went off to college with that red car, and when I got back, she had run off with the other boyfriend. So that was, a, that was I'll never forget that, because I was thinking, who would ever break up with a guy that owns a 70 Chevelle? <laughs> I still have pictures of that car, don't I, honey? That was my idol at the time, but uh, uh, thanks to Jimmy Carter, I was still in college. I was uh, uh, living with my folks uh, one summer, and it was the time when Jimmy Carter uh, was in charge, and gas prices went uh, through the roof, the opposite of what they're doing now. And I couldn't afford to drive that car, I didn't think, so I sold it and bought a brand spanking new Mitsubishi Aerojet. Got 40 miles a gallon. And I used that car, and I drove that thing till I gave it to my sister. Uh, drove the wheels off of it. Kept it for quite a while during my, uh, my single years. And, uh, and then uh, as I began working and whatnot, I went from uh, um, owning just that Aerojet to owning a Ford F-150 and a Honda XL250. And I had cars and toys you couldn't believe. And I got married. My wife can tell you. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, as I uh, went from, from shelling that, selling my Chevy Biscayne 66, which I didn't mention that my pastor gave me that had a cracked block that my dad and I overhauled together. My stepdad and I weren't connected too well. I called him Larry. He was Larry. He wasn't my dad until one day 
he told me, he says, I'll, I'll always love you like I do my own blood. And uh, he shared a scripture with me about being adopted into the family of God and that we're just as much God's children um, as, as, as we possibly can be. And so, uh, and so during that time, after I got married, I, uh, had, uh, I had switched the F-150 to a Ford Ranger. I've always had a pickup. You've got to have a pickup if you're a guy, right? You can't live without a pickup. So I got a, a Ford Ranger and a, a, a Chevy Celebrity. And I still had that Celebrity when I moved here in 97. And uh, it was a great car, and we made many trips in it, the wife and I. But uh, in the years later, moving from Colorado to Wyoming to Montana, where I met my wife, and, and then back to Montana again, I finally bought a brand new Ford F Focus. That was, that was my, my first Obama mobile. Do you know what an Obama mobile is? Well, during the years of raising children, I bought a brand spanking new uh, Dodge Caravan. And we run the wheels off of that thing back and forth to see my biological parents in Tennessee and this and that. And, uh, and so that caravan died one day uh, right over there by the high school. And the uh, water pump went out of it for the third time. And so I limped it up smoking and everything up to Snowy Mountain Motors, drove it in the lot there and said, here's my Obama, Obama mobile, <laughs> Obama mobile. And uh, I went in, picked out that Ford Focus, and I, I bought it. Because it was a car I could drive uh, brand spanking new with, without paying much for gas. Well, I didn't keep that car very long because I was never really that fond of uh, little, little cars. And so... Uh, as time went along, I uh, sold the motorcycle, downsized, and ended up, uh, ended up uh, finally paying off the caravan and, and purchased a, a Dodge 1500 I still have. Uh, it's a 97, and you can see it's uh, well used. Um, uh, and then traded the Ford Focus for Ford Escape. And uh, now I'm on my second Ford Escape because my wife ruined the first one. <laughs> if you remember, it was a bad day for us. But it was actually a glorious day for us. Because when Lance called me, you remember, don't you, Lance? Uh, your wife's been in an accident leaving church. And we were supposed to meet uh, Paula Walker and Bruce Walker for lunch. And she had a lot of things on her mind, and I don't know what happened, but she pulled out in front of uh, Kurt Langendorf's brother, and he T-boned her. And so uh, we had full coverage on that thing, thankfully, and got this new, uh, new Ford Escape that we have, we have now. So, uh, my mother-in-law gave me that Buick LeSabre, and that's a nice car. It drives pretty good, and I use it. And uh, I'm hoping, <laughs> now that we're empty nesters and, uh, and grandparents, I'm hoping to get an F-250, upgrade a little bit, and then uh, upgrade our tent camper here real soon, and the Lord willing. So you say, well, that's a long introduction about your life. Well, that's my life based on the cars that I've owned. And that's the way life kind of is. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We'll be looking at uh, passages from both 2 and 3, but 3 is the main passage that I want to read this morning. I entitled the message, A Time for Everything. There's a time for everything. And normally, this is a passage that I have read many, many, many times at funerals because of the very first verse, verse 1. And it speaks of the ebbs and flows of our journey here on earth and our ultimate purpose and our ultimate purpose so follow along uh, let this uh, sink in um, this is called a, a marismus what a marismus is in, is, is in grammar is opposite polar extremes and that's what we're going to see here matter of fact we're going to see uh, uh, an exact number 14 of them Doubled, because it's a, an extreme, both the positive and the negative. And, of course, uh, that gives you 28 divided by 7 is 4, a number of completion. So I don't think that's the Holy Spirit did that uh, just by coincidence. So this, the idea of these verses is it, it really encapsulates really the ebbs and flows of life and our journey in life without the vehicles. It goes like this. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. That really covers it, doesn't it? You were born, you're going to die. Everything else in between 
is the ebbs and flows of life. So that's the key verse. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now, the specifics of these verses are a little hard to nail down. You could really go a lot of different places, but if you step back and just look at the overall picture, what Solomon is describing is the ebbs and flows of life as a journey. And if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, the first time you read it, you think, how could Solomon be such an unhappy, cynical person? Everything is vanity, vanity, vanity. Well, the reason is, while he had a great start, he let the world suck him in. The wealth and the women and all of that. And he could see life and things going along and why were bad things happening to good people and vice versa. And so he, he was very cynical. But I don't believe he was cynical in the sense of being cynical just because he was, but because he had experienced life that he lived for himself and realized that that is vanity. And so in the end, the only thing that really matters is living life with a purpose living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in the middle of all of that, in chapter 3, he is just basically sharing this, this idea with us, I think. My first point, Audrey. Life is a journey. Go ahead and put that in. With many twists and turns, ups and downs, endings and beginnings. Take a moment. Some of, some of you are younger, and so, uh, uh, like Danny, she's not... Have you decided if you're going to go to college or what college and stuff? So you're, you're going to be making a, some decisions here, and your, your life journey is different than, than uh, let's see, uh, I don't want to pick on anybody. Like our snowbirds, the Yorks back there. Their life's a lot different than it was when they were raising their children and, and everything and working, working in the police de uh, sheriff's department, right? And so, uh, which is different than Rick, who's got this beautiful children he's raising. So life is a journey, and there will be many twists and turns, ups and, ups and downs. What wisdom is Solomon trying to communicate here? He's painting a picture of human experience from birth to death as a tapestry of various aspects of life, some of which we play a role in and others we do not. For an example, war and peace, if we take that literally... War oftentimes comes upon us without warning, like it did December 7th at Pearl Harbor. If we, if we were to internalize it and use it more as a metaphor, we could say sometimes life's going along pretty, pretty good, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a war, of a in a relationship that's gone bad. But then there's times of peace, aren't there? I was born in a time of peace. It was after the Korean Vietnam War and the Korean War. And so uh, there was never a time in my, my, my heart, even though my dad, my grandfather served in World War II, my dad was in the army, I never even considered going into the service. Why would you? We were at a time of peace. I don't, I'm not even sure they had the draft anymore in 76. Does anybody know? There was a draft in Vietnam, I know, because your brother almost got drafted. And so sometimes things come on us quickly beyond our control. Think, think about this, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Well, funerals, where we read this passage all the time, is a time to mourn. And funerals can happen quickly. One minute you're alive and the next minute you're dead, just like that. And all your plans are over. And hopefully, if you know Jesus Christ, you're in the presence of the Lord. And sometimes things are planned, 
like your wedding. Did you do any wedding planning for your wedding, or did you just say, honey, let's get married and head for Vegas? Anybody do that, by the way? You went to Buffalo. Buffalo. (laughs) But usually there's some wedding uh, planning. So ultimately, the context of what is before and after these verses helps us to understand what Solomon is trying to teach. And I believe he's trying to teach how we can live life in a way that responds to the ebbs and flows and live a life determined to love and serve God. So to do that, we've got to back up just a smidgen. So just look over there in chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 17 so I can get the full kind of flow of the, of the, of the meaning here. So I hated life, verse 17. I hated life. Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless and chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to, one, to the one who comes after me. In other words, Solomon realized all that he had amassed was going to be left to someone else, probably one of his children. How did that work out for you, Solomon? <laughs> Remember Rehoboam, Jeroboam? It didn't work out so good, did it? It's futile. He's chased after all these things, and he finally wakes up. He's supposed to be the wisest man in the world, and he is because he came full circle and realized it and wrote these important words for us in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. And who knows whether he w- excuse me, and who knows uh, whether he will be a wise man or a fool, this person coming behind you. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all the toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave it, leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. We call those trust fund babies, (laughs) right? It's really not healthy. If you have a lot of money... Just to leave it to your kids, I don't think, personally. You can help them out, but just to set up life for them so they don't have anything to struggle with is not healthy, in my opinion. I used to think, well, I see all these people getting an inheritance and buying this and that and getting this inheritance. My parents are still alive. They're probably listening today. (laughs) Uh, They're going to probably be penniless. No inheritance there. I used to go, oh, man, I'm not getting inheritance from my parents. And Mary's parents died penniless. We did get a LeSabre out of the deal. But God's changed my heart on that. Man. So, I'm going to help my children, I hope, but I'm not going to give them everything. So, Solomon, this is too meaningless and a great misfortune. Verse 22. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work, his pain and grief... Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. When we're chasing after the world, all the pressures of keeping that all together, all of a sudden what? Keep us up at night. Can you imagine? Are you, are you hearing what's going on with mental health in our country right now? It's off the charts, going in the wrong directions. Because people who thought they had their life under control are now totally out of control. And we're starting to see some civil unrest, aren't we? It's a scary time, I think. If, 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 if we were to go into a major relapse with this thing now, this summer, can you imagine what it's going to be like? I mean, it might make the dirty 30s look awful good. I don't know. You can't, we're not going to buy our way out of this. We, can, we can't just print money forever. We can't print it fast enough. So, Solomon understood all that. Now, verse 24 The key verses here, the context for which we read chapter 3. A man can do nothing better than eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, you can eat. Who can eat or find enjoyment? Without God, life has no purpose. That's what I think he's saying. To the man who pleases him... God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. Wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. 
But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing wealth to, the hand, to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless and chasing after the wind. So, like Solomon as a young man, I chose to seek the pleasures of this world and to pursue my own selfish desires rather than honor God. One day I woke up and found myself working myself to death to the detriment of my children and my wife and, 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 my, and my own health. Chapter 3, right after verse 8, comes verse 9. Listen to what it says if you haven't read ahead a little bit. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. I, I, I like to work, but it was, it was no longer any fun for me. And, and uh, you know... Uh, Back then, uh, the traveling and all that. Thankfully, God brought me to a place of brokenness and surrender. Brokenness and surrender. I made a fundamental shift in orientation in how I approached life. I shifted from living primarily for myself and pleasing and chasing my dreams to living for God and doing whatever He wanted me to do. He had me right where He wanted me. That change occurred in 1990. 1990. I was born in 1958, so you can do the math from there. After much prayer and consultation and soul searching, I wrote my boss a letter of resignation to go back to school and earn a Master's of Divinity with three children and a job that I was working with 60 hours a week like many of you are used to doing. That's why... Everybody said, oh, it'd be a pastor. It's really, it's really demanding. I got to tell you, <laughs> when the church had 25 people, I could visit them all once a week and still have time left over for my family. I mean, it was a break for me. Now, as the years went on and we started building and everything, it kind of started coming back a little bit. But uh, at any rate, in 1997, through the stupendous faithfulness of God, I became ba- pastor of Central Baptist Church, Lewistown, Montana. What a tremendous blessing of purpose and contentment God has given me for 23 years. So, number two, no matter what path you choose in life or what path life chooses for you, do you see the difference? No matter what path you choose in life or what path life chooses for you, because sometimes life chooses your path. Things happen. Ask Johnny Erickson Tata. Did she choose her path or did God, through his working in her life, when she made that fatal mistake of diving into shallow water? And yet, what greater example of someone who has contentment, happiness, joy, purpose, and love? So no matter what path you choose in life or what path life chooses for you, loving, honoring, and following God will provide purpose, peace, and fulfillment in the journey. You get that? I believe that's what Solomon is teaching us from the book of Ecclesiastes. And so with that said, I'd like to look at verses 11 through 14. 11 through 14. Number three. When we... Seek God first and honor and trust Him, we will continue to find purpose, joy, and contentment in the journey. In the journey. Notice verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in His time. Do you believe that? Yes. He's never... He's he's rarely too early, but he's never too late, I like to say. He's made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. I'm thankful for that. It was that God-empty vacuum of eternity in my heart that God eventually used to bring me to himself. Went through a series of things, and I've given my testimony many times. God brought me to himself through the through a a, a tremendous story and reconciled our family and changed our life. The most 
significant change in my journey was the day that I bowed my knee to Jesus Christ and by faith received him as my, as my Savior, asked him to forgive me of my sins, change my identity, change my purpose, change my destiny. Now, I didn't understand all that. All I understood was I didn't want to go to hell, and that's where I was going to go if I were to die. And I was just a teenager going with my hair on fire, but somehow the Holy Spirit convinced me that I was still a mortal being. And it wasn't two years after that that my best friend was killed in a head-on accident. And God just confirmed it more than ever. You don't know. I just think of Pat Knob right now. My parents know him. My mom knows the whole story. I was in college. I was heading home for Thanksgiving. Still remember it. Uh, pulled up in the driveway. Met my um, gregarious mother at the door. She usually got a big smile on her face and ready to give me a big old hug. Her son off to college and everything. Who she had been reunited with and had a loving family. And she was, like, at a funeral. That was, what's wrong, Mom? We just got word your best friend, Pat, was killed in an accident. He was driving one of them little Fiats, you know, with the low front end. And some lady in a big old giant, old, old like a Studebaker, she pulled out and she just swung too far out. She, you know, trying to steer that boat she, she swung too far out into the oncoming lane and she was turning right off of a side road, right on a hill. When he came over that hill, he had no choice. It was a closed casket. It had a convertible on that thing, went right underneath the front of it. He never knew what hit him. Life <laughs> is precious. And so, with that said, let me see if I finish the verse here. I know everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that man will revere him. Do you revere God today? I hope so. I do. I do. So when we seek God first and honor and trust him, we'll continue to find purpose, joy, and contentment in the journey. Just this last week, we were able to meet few of us men met for Bible, uh, Bible study on Tuesday morning, 6.30. Chuck's been kind of leading us through the book of uh, Proverbs, which Solomon also wrote. A lot of good stuff in there. And the verse we talked about was so appropriate. Because I was going to share this message March the 29th, first day of the shutdown. I said, Lord, did you send a worldwide pandemic so I couldn't share this? I said, no, you're not that important. But the verse we looked at, and I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation because I love it. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> and old Chuck just kept coming back. What does that look like? What does that look like? How does that look in real life? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. <laughs> when you're journeying through life, whether life comes at you or you make a, have to make a big decision, are you going to trust the Lord? So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. In all, uh, seek him in all your ways. That's, the other, that's, how, that's how we learned it at Team Kid, isn't it, Barb? <laughs> we taught this to the kids in Team Kid for years. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to, to take. So, wanted to share this March 29th, but I sure couldn't share it on a podcast. That just didn't seem appropriate. Really couldn't share it on the first Sunday after we'd been locked down because I didn't know if anybody would be here. And we had, we had a pretty good crowd. But uh, today, Mary and I are announcing that uh, we're taking a new path. A new path. We're retiring from full time vocational ministry and we're moving to Glasgow, Montana. Now, who would move from Lewistown to Glasgow? Only one person I can know of. A grandpa. <laughs> and more importantly, a grandma. And I told Mary after the accident, by her 70th birthday, we would let her be a full-time grandma. And I don't know what I'm going to do, because I'm going to trust in the Lord. I was looking pretty good till about six weeks ago. <laughs> but uh, we might have to supplement some of that 
stock till it comes back. But we'll be all right. I've always wanted to farm. I told my son-in-law, I will be here to help you harvest this year. All the way through. I know that much. With that said, I'd like to uh, let you know, I've, I've let the deacons know. I let Lance know first, of course, as a partner in ministry many weeks ago. We even had a kink in there. The week he was going to tell him his father passed. I didn't want to tell him the week his father passed. You see, so gave him a little time and shared with him, shared with the deacons. Um, I just want you to know uh, the transition. The deacons will be meeting, talking about what our transition options are, and then May 17th we're going to have come back with, with some ideas on where we go from here. Okay? And so you can get the full, um, the full ebb and flow of it of this whole thing, I'm going to read to you the letter I gave to the deacons. I'm going to ask my wife to come with me. Now, she's going to bawl and squall the whole time. I hope it doesn't. It's kind of like on the bus. When one kid has a, you know what, <laughs> they all start. So I'm going to try not to. But uh, this was dated. I gave this March 22nd. So it's a little dated now. Now, by the way, you say, well, why, why, why now? Um, we were going to announce it in January, but my main mentor um, told me that's way too long that's way too long a time you know goodbyes are hard enough but you don't got to drag them on so uh, dear Central Baptist family it is with much prayer contemplation and soul searching that Mary and I announce today that we are retiring from full time vocational ministry we're moving to Glasgow Montana to be closer to our children and grandchildren we feel strongly that this is what we want to do and believe God has released us from the shepherding role at Central Baptist Church. While we are very sad to leave such a wonderful church family and many dear friends, we are looking forward to this new chapter in our lives. If the church will allow us, we would like to continue leading the church until the end of July. I will do all I can to help our church family work through this transition. I truly believe we have a wonderful window of opportunity to assess where we are as a church and prayerfully seek God's direction and, and vision for our future. Mary, Mary and I cannot adequately express our deepest and sincere thanks to everyone, past and present, for the extraordinary privilege we had to serve as your pastor. I graduated from Denver Seminary in November of 1997 and preached my first sermon at Central Baptist Church, Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, two days after my 39th birthday. We thank God for such an incredible journey. My prayer for our church and all of us is that we will continue to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with our whole heart and remain faithful to His great commission by living out His great commandment. God bless you, Frank and Mary. So, you can have a seat, honey. I think you needed to be there for that since your name's at the bottom. All right. She did read the letter ahead of time. I did let her know about it, obviously. So I told you I have my unspoken request. I've had it on the prayer list for a while. If you get that and you pay any attention to it. My unspoken prayer request is this. It's that our church would stay prayerful, hopeful, and unified before, during, and after our transition to the, next le to the next step in this journey. I've asked the deacons to take the lead in putting together a transition leadership team to help guide our church through the process. We'll begin that information and sharing May the 17th at our business meeting. I don't know if we'll have business to, to conduct at that time, but if the deacons think that we need to put together a transition team and an interim uh, transition plan. We're going to flesh that out, bring it to you. But everything we do will be, as it always has been, uh, congregational, fully involved in the process. Okay? I don't know what it'll be exactly yet. Uh, we've got ideas. I've been having the deacons pray and read, do a lot of reading on different things. But my, my unspoken prayer, prayer request is that we be prayerful, hopeful, and unified before, during, and after the transition. Please begin praying 
as we transition from one chapter to the next. So now that you know, you can begin to pray. And we'll walk through this process together until the end of July. And wherever it's at at that time, we will not be here. But we'll be always in prayer, always available. I've got, uh, since I couldn't announce it, I couldn't take the risk back early to announce it, I uh, signed up for a, uh, a wedding in August. I'm going to do uh, Cole Brevik's wedding, a friend of my son's, uh, getting married. And uh, I signed up to preach at the uh, associational meeting because in the meeting, unbeknownst to me, they nominated our church and me as the newest church in the association. So September 9th, I'll be bringing a message. I'm not sure what I'm going to preach about to a bunch of preachers who are still <laughs> ministering. Oh, you guys, you can't wait till you see retirement. All your problems will be over. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll encourage them somehow. Um, and I also got all my, my tags for the central Montana area. So that's where the camper comes in. So uh, I think Marie's going to let me park it out at her place if I'm not parked up at your place, Rick. So uh, this year won't be one day here and a day there. <laughs> It'll be a week here and two weeks there. So, um, yeah, not an easy thing to do. Uh, I already did enough crying, so I've been able to get through all this. But, but uh, as always, for 23 years, I have an open-door policy. Anything you want to ask, anything you want to share, anything you want to know, depending on if I want to tell you or not, uh, some things I may, may not share with you. But uh, you're welcome to uh, contact me. All right? So, um, we've sang this song a few times before as our closing today. Uh, Terry, if you come. Uh, when my wife and I were married, uh, she robbed the cradle, so that's part of the problem, so blame her. <laughs> if I was 70, I'd definitely be retired, but uh, I'm not 70 yet. But she will be soon, and uh, she deserves it. And so... Uh, we think this is a good time. Not sure where the coronavirus came into the whole picture, but it, it, it did shake my, my thoughts a little bit at first, but then uh, I went back to, Lord, is this, is this what you want? And he said yes. So uh, we're going to uh, stand. We can't do like we normally do and go across uh, the aisles and shake, uh, hold hands, but you can hold the hand of your loved one and your family. Uh, we sang this at our first uh, at, at our first wedding, <laughs> our only wedding. <laughs> so, honey, why don't you come up here? I can hold your hand. I'll help you out here. We're going to sing "Bind Us Together," and then I'm going to close this with a scripture that I want us to uh, use as our key scriptures for this uh, transition. Okay? And so, uh, matter of fact, memorize it if you haven't already. All right. Sing this together with us. It's actually three verses. But these are the verses God's given to me for us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a, such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. I've, I've told that when a pastor's been this, here this long, oftentimes a church can get into a terrible place. 
I look at what poor Kurt's been going through over at Celebration trying to retire. It's been, tr it's been tough. Not because of the people, they're just the process. It's a, not an easy process, but let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The race marked out for us. Your race is different than mine, but we all have kind of the same goal, the same finish line. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The worst legacy I could leave is if this thing fell apart because people had their eyes fixed on the wrong person. We've got to have our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at right hand of the uh, the right hand of the throne of God. That was the end of his journey <laughs> that, he, that he had. Consider him who endured su uh, such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Some of you are already weary. And you're going, oh, this is all I, we need now is to have to go through this process. It's not going to be easy one. It's going to be a lot of work. But keep our eyes focused on, focused on Jesus. Amen? Amen. God, dismiss us in your grace and your love. Lord, I'd like to shake every hand and give everybody a big hug today. Can't do that. So I'm just going to stand out front here and smile and, and tell them how much I love them. Mary, how much we love them. And uh, we thank you. Now give us wisdom, guidance, direction, purpose in the days ahead. This is a, a kind of a major, major milestone for, for us, but also for our church family. And we'll trust you in it all and keep our eyes fixed on you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All God's people said? Amen. 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 Good. There was a few amens there.